idea was it? Um, it was our singing teachers actually. She thought it'd be good to try us out together and we both sounded quite good when we sang what we did. Okay, you're not saying much Jonathan. Are you shy? Uh, sometimes. I've always had sort of problems with my size since I, I can remember and when I was in sort of primary school it was back then really that I had sort of the mick taken out of me and it, it kind of damaged my confidence quite a bit. When, when people would say something to me I'm quite protective of John and Lynn. Like, if someone, if I was there, someone stood there and said something to me, I wouldn't sit. I couldn't sit there with my mouth shut. Before you make a judgment on someone, you really need to get to know them. It's not. It's cliche. It's not judgment, but like, you've got, you've got to read what's inside. Charlotte's been a really big help for me in terms of confidence and making me a better performer. And I really think I'm going up on stage today when I'm going to be on stage. Thank you. Thank you. Jonathan, you are a future star. As a 
I record all of our uh, lectures uh, uh, so that you can listen to them again if you need to. Some people um, aren't used to the American accent. I may talk too fast. Um, and so it will be on YouTube and embedded back into our Moodle um, e-learning site. If you uh, then go to, uh, go to YouTube, uh, after I've posted it for a day or so, you'll find that it has transcribed it, and so you can actually read what I said, although uh, it's not perfect transcription, but it's pretty close, and so students who are in my class uh, appreciate being able to review it again in writing uh, in case they miss something in the original form. I will try to speak slower. I do, sometimes I get excited about stuff I'm talking about, and I start uh, sounding like a machine gun to you, probably. And, uh, and so I apologize that for that in, in, in advance. Um, I just, uh, after I uh, got here in May, um, I, they sent out a solicitation to lecturers to prepare general education courses. And this is uh, something that has been a subject that has been uh, an important part of my life for many years, actually. Uh, besides working in the industry, in the communications industry myself, and pursuing success in my own life, um, I also, um, a couple of things, a couple of my jobs. One was I was teaching at a, a local university where um, near a nuclear uh, reservation in America where they had created the enriched uranium uh, to build the bombs that were dropped in World War II in Japan. Um, and, but at the end of the, of the uh, Cold War, suddenly all this, the, uh, all of the industry related to building weapons was shut, was shut down. And so they, they, uh, it was a relatively small, or is a relatively small, uh, city, about, altogether about 200,000 people live there. And uh, so out of those, uh, maybe half of those or less actually work. Um, and they laid off 5,000 people from the nuclear industry and didn't, without any warning, they, they were all shell-shocked. They were all discouraged. Uh, some of them were managers who had lived there for, you know, had worked there for, for decades. Uh, and they had no idea what to do the rest of their lives. Uh, some of them were secretaries and at the other end of the of the scale and and uh, they knew they probably 
at least they suspected they wouldn't get as good a job because the federal government and related industries pay very well. Uh, a lot of them were very stressed out. In fact, um, in America we have a term called going postal. Anybody know what going postal means? Uh, when we refer to going postal, it's actually getting a gun and shooting people. <laughs> Uh, because the first, uh, some of the, the most famous incidents happened at a post office. Um, and somebody got laid off from postal work and he brought a gun and killed people. So now we refer to that as going postal. Um, and so they actually brought in guards into our, our training center uh, in case somebody went postal um, and uh, decided to start shooting because they were that upset about losing their jobs. Um, so... They hired me to, first off, recruit people to come to our training center, what was called the Reemployment Opportunity Center. And they kind of gave me a, a blank sheet, so to speak, of paper and said, here, you decide what you're going to be doing. And so the very first thing I, I did was set up a success strategies course uh, to try to talk to people and try to share with them uh, hope hope that they did have something in their future that was worth looking forward to because they were, as I said, very, very discouraged. And secondly, teach, start teaching them some principles about uh, how to approach their future. And uh, many of them afterwards uh, you know, told me or wrote to me and said how I basically I helped change their lives because uh, they were so discouraged and after the class they uh, the course that I taught, they felt like they they, they were excited about their future now. Um, it, the uh, And one of the books I used for that was a book that at that time was fairly new, a book called uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. How many of you have heard of that book? Okay, not too many of you. Um, in America, it's uh, it's been uh, named the, one of the top two business management books ever written, well, written in the 20th century, let me put it that way. Um, and the author of it, a man named Stephen Covey, has toured the world uh, consulting with top business executives, uh, presidents and prime ministers. Uh, everybody wanted to talk to Stephen Covey because of the impact of this book. Um, and I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, that was one of the things I, I used, but I also used other sources, like I will in this class. Uh, the Seven Habits will be our core, kind of our basic textbook for the class, uh, but we will go far beyond that. Um, so let me kind of, uh, before I get too far afield here, um, oh, I guess let me finish the story. Besides that, which was a very positive uh, uh, opportunity for me, Later, I was uh, I I, uh, I won a contract with the state of Washington. The main part of the contract was to uh, was to be the editor and publisher of a uh, bilingual newspaper about uh, education, bilingual and migrant education, uh, bilingual in being English and Spanish, uh, since uh, the Spanish, uh, the Mexicans, so forth, make up the bulk of the of the recent immigrants to, to America and the migrant population, those that are going from town to town or area to area to work in the fields especially, or in some cases uh, uh, in the fishing industry, they might work in Washington State part of the year and go up to Alaska part of the year, stuff like that. So those would all be considered migrants. And uh, they are the worst achieving uh, segment of, of uh, American uh, students because, first off, many of them don't speak English very well, if at all. Secondly, they're moving from town to town, so they don't get settled into one, one uh, situation very long. They may not even hardly get to know their teachers. They may hardly get to know their, their classmates. Um, schools in America are, do not work under a strict, um, a strict curriculum. They don't share the same curriculum. And so if you move from one city to another city, uh, they may not, may not even teach the same classes. If they teach the same class, they're probably not going to be in the same place in the book, but probably they may very well not use the same book. And so you go from city to city, from school to school, 
and you're lost every time you move. Uh, you start from scratch. And so uh, half of all migrant students drop out and never finish high school. Uh, so that uh, what my job was first off initially was to uh, prepare this bilingual publication uh, about kind of uh, best practices in, uh, uh, in migrant education um, and also kind of uh, best opportunities, you might say. And so it was, it was, uh, it was uh, uh, made available to both uh, educators and to uh, migrant parents to help them understand uh, what they could do and what, uh, what, the, what they could expect to the school. Um, but as part of that, also, I became uh, one of the things I started reporting on that then kind of really drew me in was a, uh, a program called the Student Leadership Program. And it was an award winning program uh, where they would invite uh, like maybe 80 students every year, 100 students every year to come to a three day conference and teach them success strategies and teach them. Uh, that they didn't have to be satisfied with working in the fields all their lives, uh, that they could go to the university, that they could do something that they might prefer to do. And after those three days, um, it totally changed their lives. I have, uh, I didn't put them in the PowerPoint, but uh, actually I didn't even think about talking about this part. But anyway, I have pictures of big football players uh, hugging their mentors and crying uh, openly because of how, what an impact it had in their lives, just those three days. And, and after those three days, uh, instead of 50% uh, graduating, 80% graduated, and many of those 80% would go on to the university because of this program. So uh, I helped build the curriculum for it, and, and uh, even though that wasn't my main job, I loved working in that program and seeing the lives of uh, young people change. Um, one of the things I wrote, and I wish I could remember verbatim, although even though I wrote it, uh, in one of, the, one of my publications was, if a student doesn't want to learn, you can't force him. But once he gains goals of his own and, and desires to learn, you can't stop him. And so that's kind of part of this, the point of this uh, class, is to help you uh, set your own goals Think about your own mission in life. What do you want to accomplish in life? Uh, what will it be that will make you happy? What will it be that will make you successful? Um, and maybe set some goals. Uh, in our student leadership program, we talked about the big goals. But we also talked about stepping stone goals. Uh, you know what stepping stones are? Uh, for those that may not, if you're trying to get across a, a creek, a river, you know, a small river or something, you might have some stones. You might actually throw them from the shore out into the creek a little bit so you can step on the stones instead of getting your feet wet to get to the other side. And so our goals are on the other side of the creek, on the other side of the river. And to get there uh, and not get our feet wet, so to speak, um, we need to set up some stepping stone goals. How do I get there from here? And so stepping stone goals are, you might say, sub goals or whatever. So I want you to think about that. Um, let me introduce myself a little bit, however, first. Um, I don't think I need to use this uh, myself, do I? You guys can hear me okay? Um, I actually brought this more for you. So, uh, so at some point I'm going to have, some, have you guys talking, and I will want to, uh, uh, some of you talk kind of softly. So. Uh, I also just wanted to test the sound system here to make sure, for one thing, that I, you could hear the videos. Because um, I want to use a lot of videos in this class. Uh, a lot of your homework will be watching videos. Uh, as if you didn't watch enough already, right? Um, but that's a lot. Of, that's part of our curriculum. Is Yes, I do want you to uh, uh, be, become familiar with the, the book, The Seven Habits, and we have a kind of an abridged version of it that we'll put up on the uh, e-learning site, the Moodle site. Uh, and also we have another book about uh, college success, how to achieve success in college per se. And I'm going to have you all as, as teams present that book uh, so that we can uh, 
kind of bring success down to our level right here at the university level. Um, but uh, and so in that process, if you're going to be presenting, I want you, I want to be able to hear you. And some of you, particularly young women, are particularly soft-spoken. So I, I, we need to bring a turn on the uh, microphone. Um, anyway, I uh, that is my name, Ken Harvey. However, I don't. Uh, Harvey is the family name, as you know, and uh, probably know in America we go first name, our given name first, our our family name second. Um, and so my my name is really my last name. My family name is Harvey. That's some that's hard for some people to pronounce uh, who aren't uh, native English speakers. And so um, I am typically called just Dr. Ken. That's pretty easy to say and pretty easy to remember. Uh, and I actually don't care if you just call me Ken. Uh, I consider myself more of a professional than a professor. I've been in the newspaper industry and in the, the communications industry overall for most of my life. And uh, if I were to go into a newsroom and say, you will call me Dr. Ken, uh, they would throw me out the window. And so I would not be doing that. In fact, I've done research that says that um, if a newspaper or a, a communications executive had a choice between hiring somebody with a master's degree and a PhD, everything else being equal, they would hire the one with a master's degree. They don't want a person with a PhD even on the place. And so if I were to decide to go back into the industry, I would, get, I would send a CV without my PhD on it. They would not, to the best of my ability, I would hide the fact that I had a PhD. So um, Ken is fine, Dr. Ken is fine, whatever you feel comfortable with is fine. Uh, but a quick uh, background, uh, about 25 years in journalism, 18 years in higher education, seven years in migrant bilingual education, seven years as a corporate marketing and PR director, four years as a government official, one year in broadcasting, five years in book publishing, 20 years in web creation and management, but I'm not 100 years old. Uh, I am a workaholic, and frequently I do more than one thing at once. Um, that's just the way I am. So right now I have about 10 web pages, websites that I, that I uh, create and manage. Uh, I'm working on two books, well, really three books. Uh, I'm, uh, I create videos. Uh, uh, last night I had a, uh, I'll probably show it in this class, I, I uh, did an interview with a former student of mine who's uh, kind of a, an up-and-coming YouTuber, a successful YouTuber with uh, 450 uh, uh, subscribers, 450,000 subscribers and 20,000 views. And so uh, how she got to where she's at I thought might be interesting to you guys. Um, and so I, that might be one of, uh, even though she's just kind of starting, I and mean, she's just a little bit older than you, uh, she's just getting started. Uh, it's still an interesting trip that she's taken uh, and can be uh, some lessons learned from that. Uh, just quickly, this was my, uh, my bilingual newspaper. Uh, this was a uh, weekly newspaper uh, made in more of a magazine style, kind of like the Star is, has a more of a magazine front than the traditional news front. Uh, this is an entertainer magazine that uh, I edited and published and owned. Uh, a blog site that I, that I established and I don't update it as much as I should, but uh, it's a blog site that I, I want to do some more work on because uh, uh, I have RSS feeds on the left and right. So the media in America that I consider liberal, I put in the left. The media in America I consider conservative, I put in the right, because one of the biggest problems I think in America right now is that people aren't getting to understand both sides of the story. And so my blog site has actual news on it, not just my opinion. Um, I, like I said, I've been a bush book publisher. Here's a couple of my books that uh, were published in bilingually in English and Russian. Um, for a, uh, a non-government organization project that I created. Um, another book that I just was just uh, released last year uh, that I co-authored with uh, another professor, uh, former professor here at Chiman. Um, and I, this one I was writing about uh, the impact of uh, 
uh, web and mobile technologies and essentially all aspects of society and economy, education, news, branding, uh, business overall, uh, marketing overall, and so forth. Uh, this is uh, an online TV channel that I created, uh, especially to, uh, it's kind of a model that I'm suggesting for NGOs to help uh, draw more people to their websites and kind of a long story, I won't get into that. Um, I do, like I said, online videos. This is uh, one one of the videos I do on, uh, it's kind of like a webinar about online strategic marketing. Um, and there's lots of others. Uh, right now we're making a video, but this one isn't a very fine-tuned video that we're making today. I was in PR marketing for a while, uh, while I wanted to have more of a normal job uh, while my kids were teenagers. Uh, so I did books and, and uh, PR and other promotional material for technical firms, uh, engineering, architectural firms. Um, so frequently when we would have proposed for a job, like a $10 million job, uh, we wouldn't send them a brochure, we'd send them a 200-page book. And so my job was creating a customized book for that each project, major project we'd go after. Um, I use my skills in uh, campaigning for my, the one on the left is me, a long time ago, uh, where I ran for the city council in our, our city and won that uh, easily. And uh, the one on the right was uh, a long time ago, in the early 1970s, I ran a campaign for a mayoral candidate in Tampa, Florida, and did well with that. Um, might talk about it another time. I think I skipped that one. Um, I will talk about this a little bit. Uh, I try to get you as involved as I can, and so I'm going I'm to have you do some writing. I'm going to have you do some presenting, because my belief is is that you remember more when you're involved than if you're if I'm just lecturing to you. Um, I believe that, that helps kind of ingrain the material more into your brain. It creates long-term memory rather than short-term memory. Uh, I'm sure that you have uh, all experienced what this is talking about. I certainly did. That from lecture, you know, you might remember most of the lecture, maybe be able to pass a test in the first three hours after the lecture. But uh, in three days, you remember maybe 10% of it. Um, from a demonstration where you can actually see it and hear it, then uh, you might remember 72% in three hours and 20% in three days. Uh, from a demonstration and explanation, 85% um, in three hours, 65% uh, in three days. But when students uh, demonstrate and explain themselves, they remember all of it. Obviously, if they're the one presenting, they remembered all of it in three hours and 85% in three days. And I believe they remember a, a fairly high percentage of what they present and what they write about for months, if not years. Um, and so I, I, I believe in getting students involved um, because I wouldn't even sure anybody's going to show up today. I don't quite understand the, uh, the enrollment system here, but the last thing I saw in my, in my uh, page from the academic affairs, nobody had enrolled yet. And so uh, I have not finalized the syllabus. Uh, I, have, I will uh, uh, post it on our e-learning site and our Moodle site. Uh, so you'll have that in the next few days and you can see more specifically what I'm gonna expect you to do. As I mentioned, we have the second textbook, uh, College Success. I'll have you as teams present that out of that book while I'm presenting more out of the uh, uh, Covey Seven Habits book. And, uh, and you'll do some writing, but your writing will not be so much about what you've learned but more about how you want to apply what you've learned. In other words, I want you to write about your goals. I want to, and so some of the writing, I, I will basically, my grading of it will be yes or no, or kind of yes, kind of, or no. Uh, yes, meaning you took it seriously and you did a good job. Uh, kind of means you really didn't take it very seriously, but you did it. And no, you either didn't do it or just you know, brushed it off as inconsequential. So mostly that sort of writing will be easy as far as grades go. Uh, it will maybe be harder 
in a sense, because you actually have to think about it and think about what you want to do with your lives. And so uh, some of your writing will be totally yours, totally about you, not about, not directly about Covey. I may ask you, how does uh, this principle that Covey taught apply to you? How would you apply this principle in your lives? And so, yes, it relates to Covey or relates to one of these videos I'll have you watch, <clears throat> but it'll also relate to you, what you want to do and what you, how you want to apply it. So that writing will be, yes, writing. You'll get to practice your writing, but I will not be grading you based on your grammar and spelling, although I do need to understand what you're writing. So hopefully your writing will be good enough that I can read it. Uh, but beyond that, uh, I won't be, it'll be mostly, can, did you really take this seriously? Did you try? Did you actually do, do something that took some effort on your part? Not just the number of words, but the amount of thinking you had to do to do it. Um, <clears throat> one of the most important things I believe in education uh, is attitude. Uh, there is uh, there is no there's hardly any correlation between your GPA and your uh, your uh, potential for success in life. There's almost no correlation. Uh, I like to tell the story of two friends of mine. Uh, one was the smartest kid in our high school, a strict 4.0 uh, out of 4.0, never got anything less than an A. Um, the other one was only passed in classes because teacher didn't want him to come back again. Uh, you know, they might give him a C minus or a D, just get out of here sort of person. Uh, so we graduated. The smartest kid was disturbed by the philosophy, by his philosophies of life and what he wanted to do. He hadn't taken my class. He didn't know what he wanted to do. And so he became a truck driver for several years so he could think. And so he drove, his, drove the big semi-trucks and thought and thought and thought. And after several years, decided to become a prison counselor. So he took... He, majored, I guess, in counseling at the university and, um, and has worked at a prison all of his life, helping inmates to figure out how not to come back again and how to get out and succeed in life. Uh, the dumb friend of mine, if you want to call him that, dumb, um, he didn't like school. He, wouldn't, he didn't hardly try to remember how to write well. He didn't care how what kind of grades he got in, in math. He didn't care much about any of the other subjects he had to take, that they forced him to take. There was one thing he was passionate about, mechanics. And so he became a master mechanic. Not only a master mechanic, he became a college instructor in mechanics. And so here, the smartest kid in class became a prison counselor. The stupidest kid in class, quote unquote, became a college instructor. What's the correlation? No correlation. Which one do you suppose I admire the most? I admire the one that was told for 12 years in the American education system he's an idiot. Every year his teacher said, not maybe not in so many words, but in his report cards, he said, Dennis, you're an idiot. Dennis, you're an idiot. 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 For years, he was told he's an idiot, and yet he became a college instructor. I admire the heck out of him for that. I don't know that I could have, I could have uh, stood that. I, our our self image is so based on what other people think of us. Uh, the, this video, one reason I, I like to watch this video that I did uh, as we started class, is everybody looked at that overweight guy and thought he is a loser. Right? Everybody kind of thought, what a loser. You know, this is going to be a disaster. And then he opened his mouth and just blew them away. Uh, he would not accept the loser uh, label that, so, that people wanted to put on him. Um, and he obviously had something he loved and he was passionate about. So to me, uh, there is a, a, the positive thinking, just positive thinking has a much higher correlation with success in life than does GPA. 
So personally, I would just as soon have, in fact, it has been recommended that there only be two grades. Uh, not in this university. In most universities or in, in schools don't accept this idea. But the idea is you either pass it or you fail it. You either know what we taught you or you don't know, and so you have to keep coming back until you know it. Otherwise, it's a, it's a failed system if you don't learn what we tried to teach you. And so either you get an A or you get an I for incomplete, and you come back and keep going. Um, I kind of like that idea, personally, that nobody can graduate without straight A's, uh, because that means that you learn, actually learned what you were supposed to learn. Uh, of course, in the process of doing that, I would like what you were expected to learn to be worthwhile learning. And some classes, I think, are not worth learning. Uh, that's another issue. Um, other things that are important, communication skills, I think, are very important. Um, not only I think that, but I, I mentioned I, for most of the 1990s, I was working in PR marketing for technical firms. Uh, and I worked for two different firms, primarily. They were both engineering and architectural firms. And my job was to was to market their their technical skills and expertise. And both CEOs independently came to me and said, "Ken, I wish that I'd taken more classes in communications." Now they were engineers. They were CEOs of engineering firms. There's not much, there not many things that are much different or much. Uh, broader apart, so you might say, far apart than, than uh, uh, communication and engineering. You know, if you're going to look at two uh, possible uh, fields to pursue, uh, that's about as far apart as you can get. Uh, but they both say, Ken, uh, I wish I'd taken more communication classes because while engineering is absolutely essential for my success, the key to success is really communications, even for an engineer. He would not have been CEO if he weren't naturally a good communicator. Um, and so, anyway, communication skills are, are vital for anybody, no matter what your field is. Uh, it, you don't have to be a communication major to, for communications to be essential for your success. Uh, computer skills, I believe, are, are extremely important because computers make up for a lot of our deficiencies. If we have poor spelling and grammar, computers can fix that. If we have, if we don't understand math, computers can do it for us. If we don't, you know, whatever it is, you know, there's hardly any deficiency that the computers can't, can't pretty much uh, uh, solve for us. Uh, and the last one is memory-based learning. Like I said, it has no correlation with success in life. There's hardly any job in the world that requires you to memorize stuff that isn't really interesting and, and, and relevant to you. Hardly any job in the world. Um, and, those, and, and instead, you know and learn and, mem and remember those things that are important to your success. You automatically do that. You don't have to be a genius to do that. In fact, you can be an idiot and do that, literally. Not just my friend Dennis, who had no problem remembering how to fix a car and could not remember math, he had no problem with that because that was important to him. I have a nephew who uh, has about a 70 IQ, uh, maybe lower, I'm not really sure what it would be, but he's 40 years old. He does not know how to read other than just a few words. Uh, he does not know how to write very much except maybe his name. So this guy is, you know, would be labeled kind of dumb, right? Um, some people call him retarded, and in a very clinical sense, that is what he is. He's his uh, he is clinically considered retarded, disabled, mentally disabled to some extent. He had some problems as a when he was first born and had was uh, enter, was uh, was uh, uh, deprived of oxygen for a little while, and and, and so it did some damage to him. So in most areas, he's not going to compete with you. In the area of nature, none of you would compete with him. All he does, he just loves sitting around and watching nature shows on cable. And he can tell you more about wildlife and stuff than any of you would know, I'm sure. 
Maybe if you're majoring in biology, maybe I'm wrong. But for the average person, for including myself, no matter how smart you think you are, you're toast if you try to compete with him on the area of nature because that's important to him. Uh, and anything kind of related to it. Uh, for example, my, my mom uh, was watching a game show with him one day and uh, the question was asked uh, about where the Gobi Desert was. And uh, this retarded nephew of mine said, uh, well, my mom wasn't sure. Americans are kind of ignorant when it comes to world geography. And she thought it was in China, but she wasn't sure. Uh, and so she, she, you know, as they were conversing, deciding what was the right answer to this quiz, quiz show, uh, this nephew said, oh, that's in China, a little bit of Mongolia. They have this animal and these animals and these animals, and they do this, and told her all about the Gobi Desert. Um, she later on asked his brother, who was a, a computer uh, guru, uh, about the Gobi Desert, and he thought it was in Africa. Okay, and he didn't he didn't already know anything about it. So people remember what's important to them, including somebody who people consider retarded or stupid or whatever label you want to put on them. They remember what's important to them, and so memory. It, it, while it's certainly it's what one thing that makes us different than all the other animals is our the, the the sophistication of our of our brain, our memory. You don't sit up nights memorizing a book about your job unless you haven't taken the class, you know, a related class and in, in, at the university or something. You're going to learn. You're going to go into that job, and they're going to have different equipment than you've learned. They're going to have different software than you learned. They're going to have different systems than you learned. And you're going to learn that, and they're going to expect to give you time to learn it. And you're going to remember it, and it's not going to be a problem. No job, hardly any job in the world uh, has memory uh, or, you know, the, the sort of memory required at a university as a requirement for the job. Hardly anyone. Um, so, anyway, that to me is the lowest level of priority in education. And again, if it's something you can memorize, guess what? You have a computer. You don't need to memorize it. Um, here's a question, a couple of questions. Do you love what you're good at? Or are you good at what you love? What do you think? What do you think? Get some comments out here. This is more important. What, which is true? Do you love what you're good at, or are you good at what you love? Okay. Anybody else have a different opinion? Nationalized test of America, I was rated 99 and two thirds percentile in math. But I didn't want to have a career in math. I wanted to have a career in communications. And so communications was my hardest subject. And it wasn't, you know, I wasn't flunking or anything, but it was my hardest subject. But I wanted to be a communicator because I wanted to share ideas. Ideas were more important to me than math. And so while I loved math, and I was very good at it, I loved communication more. I loved the idea of sharing ideas and, and ideals with people. And so I took my weakest subject and became strong at it. Um, so, um, but I think both are, have some truth to them. It's kind of, it's hard to choose between the two. Uh, typically over a period of time, however, over a period of time, I think it is true that um, that you're going to be good at what you love. And for that reason, I suggest to uh, students that if they're in the wrong major, get the heck out of it. If they don't love what they're majoring in, if they're doing what their parents want them to do, send their parents to me. Because the problem is, is that once you get your degree, you will stop studying it. Of all ages of history, 
This is the age of lifelong learning. You cannot stop learning in this age and still be good at what you do. Things are changing too rapidly. With the technologies we have, with all the, all the amazing things that, are, that are, are happening in our world, if you stop learning about whatever your major is when you graduate, you're going to be really stupid after about four years. You're, not going, to, you're going to be so far behind in four years, let alone eight years or 12 years or 16 years or whatever multiple of four I might want to give to it. Uh, you are going to be stupid. And so if you, I, I, for some reason, I keep running into economic students here and in Kazakhstan who are economic students because their parents made them be economic students. Um, I had one that took one class from me. Um, and I taught her how to write uh, in journalistic style. And not only that, though, I mostly pumped her up. And I asked her this, I talked to her about what she really wanted to do because she was an excellent writer. And I said, you know, if you can't change your major at the very least, don't give up on your writing. I will, I will help you and you can, even though your degree is in economics, you can be a professional communicator. And so she graduated and immediately got a job as a magazine with my help because she was good. That was what she loved. That was her passion. But her parents made her go into economics. Um, <laughs> you, if you're not, if you don't want to study economics in the long term, you're not going to be good at, at it after a few years. Uh, too much is going on. So, for the long term, you're going to be good at what you love. In the short term, you know it's 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 kind of a question. It's questionable. You're kind of debated a little bit. Long term, yeah, you have to love it. You have to want to keep studying it. You have to want to. You have to be passionate about it to be really good at it. So. Um, so that's my suggestion to you too. I know it's hard to change majors at this university, and maybe you can't, but you need to recognize there's a problem. If you don't love what you're studying, you may get straight A's at this university, but you're going to have a hard trouble, you're going to have a hard time being successful in your career if you don't love what you're, what you're studying. That's a problem. Your parents need to talk to me. I'll explain it to them. Uh, and like I said, how hard it is to remember what is useful and relevant to you. That's not hard at all. That doesn't mean doesn't require uh, super memory. Uh, not at all. So when I talk about attitude being the most important thing, I'm talking about being passionate, having a sense of mission, uh, having a positive attitude for sure, having a strong work ethic. Uh, but if you really are passionate about what you're doing, it's not even work. I grew up in a farm. I did not want to live on a farm. I did not want to go work 12 hours in the sun uh, every day in, in the summertime uh, and get up early in the morning before school and change irrigation with icicles uh, on, the, on the irrigation pipes we're having to change. I didn't want to do that. Um, and so that, to me, was about as hellish an experience as a kid can have uh, working on a farm when he didn't love farming. Uh, so this is not work. What I'm doing now is not work. Uh, compared to that, no. Um, I've never, after I left home, after, after, left, after I left the farm, I basically don't think I worked a day in my life. Um, I just have had fun. So when you really are passionate about something, yeah, you need to, you should be, you will be putting work into it. You will have a strong work ethic because you're passionate about it. Uh, and that's important, especially as it relates to lifelong learning. Again, if you're passionate, if you're interested, if you're curious, if you're uh, hungry to understand uh, more about it and so forth, then you'll be very successful because you'll keep learning and growing and progressing. A lot of the stuff I do now, I took no class in ever. Uh, all the websites I created, I've never taken a web design class or a web programming class. I've never taken a uh, video creation class. I've, I've taken TV broadcast, but that's not like what we do for online. I've never taken, I don't think I've taken a PR class. I don't remember. I've taken some kind of related cat classes, but PR is so strongly related to journalism that I could adapt my journalism skills to PR. 
And as a publisher, I had to deal with advertising all the time. So advertising is marketing. So it was easy to make the transition over to PR advertising. That was pretty easy to do. But uh, uh, a lot of stuff I've done in my life, I've never been trained for uh, formally. And you will find the same thing. Uh, you will begin pursuing things that are of interest to you, and it may take you totally outside your, your major, even if your major correlates with your passion. Uh, you'll find different paths to go on, different ways. So, you know, I was a print journalist. I was, uh, so my emphasis in university was print journalism. Well, a lot of things have happened since then. Uh, now it's a multimedia world in journalism. So I had to learn multimedia. Um, it's a computer world. I had to expand my understanding of computers and how to use computer-based tools. Um, you know, it's a, now the internet. The internet did not, did not exist, or at least the World Wide Web did not exist. The, the internet was just being created when I was leaving college. Uh, and there was not a World Wide Web, per se, the, the easy interface that we have with, with, uh, with the internet. And so I had to learn that. Uh, lots and lots of things have happened since I left my college classroom. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, accessing. Oops, that's. I thought I changed that. That is. I should have changed that. That is not your password. Uh, we'll get that in a second. Uh, some of you have already got done this before. Those that are new, if you need some help, you can ask me. Help others. But basically, uh, to get into our. I know some of the first year students have never been on the Moodle site. You can go to the, our, the front page of the, uh, of the university website, go to library, click that. It'll take you into here. Click on uh, information. You'll get that drop-down menu, uh, and you'll see a, the word Moodle. Moodle is the e-learning site. Click on that. That'll take you in here, give you some instructions. Um, click on uh, that uh, link. Uh, in that under number one, I'll take you to the, the Moodle site. Um, this is a little bit closer up of that same one. Your, your password or your key in this is success 2017A, because there's two sections of it, at least right now. It might, depending on the enrollment, it might become one section. I don't know. But right now there's two sections, so this would be success 2017A, and the other one will be success 2017B. Um, once you get into the Moodle site uh, that uh, had that had the link in, you know, link to in the previous slide, uh, you go to the login. You use your standard student uh, ID and password to get into it. Um, on the uh, excuse me, before you do that, don't go in yet, but just scroll down on this page. And if you scroll down on this page, the front page of the Moodle site, you'll see a Moodle Quick Guide. Click into that. Uh, it has some introductory information I pretty much already covered. Uh, scroll down further, you come to this, uh, Moodle Quick Start for Students, and that tells you how to uh, enroll into a course. There's a video demonstration there, and uh, so you can do that. And uh, then you would apply the, the password, the key, as you uh, uh, click in the, on Enroll Me, and you would enroll into the the online version of the course. Anyway, all this is on the PowerPoint. Uh, if you need some instructions and you haven't done this before, ask me, ask somebody, uh, ask one of the, those that has been, ha, have been here before, or ask I, the IT department. Anyway, then you would, in, you would log in, and you would, again, that's where you would log in, that would look like, and you would go here, click on the course, uh, that's not that course, but the go down, there's the Success Strategies course, and uh, it would uh, kick you over to the enrollment key. Uh, I talked already about The Seven Habits, our key textbook by Stephen Covey. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, there have been more than 25 million copies of it printed in 40 different languages. So this is an extremely popular book, it's been an extremely successful book. Uh, he, the uh, author, Stephen Covey, was named one of Time Magazine's uh, 25 Most Influential Americans. Forbes Magazine named The Seven Habits as one of the top 10 most influential managed book, books ever. A uh, survey of Chief Executive Magazine found uh, The Seven Habits was one of the, mo of the two most influential books of the 20th century. 
So it comes, uh, I, I went on the uh, Amazon site the other day and they have about a hundred uh, recommendations for the book by people that whose names you would recognize, famous people, rich people, uh, so forth, uh, re recommend this book. There was a study done a few years ago uh, by, uh, uh, by an academic organization and they asked employers uh, what was the basis of their hiring somebody? What was the key to their hiring, choosing one applicant over another applicant? These were their top ten items that they found. Almost none of these have to do with your major. They asked them, uh, the number one was communication skills. Oops, I mentioned that already, didn't I? Number one, communication skills, according to the employers. Number two, team working skills. These two are both part of, uh, of what Covey teaches in his book. Number three was integrity. Covey talks a lot about integrity. Um, number four, intellectual ability. The book doesn't cover that. Uh, confidence is covered and in, in, uh, is part of the Covey book. Character, personality, definitely part of the Covey book. Planning and organizational skills, definitely part of the Covey book. Literacy, not so much. Uh, numeracy, not so much. Analysis and decision making, definitely part of the Covey book. So out of the top 10 reasons why somebody might hire you in the future, this book covers uh, most of them. Uh, so this is relevant to you. Uh, it, we're, it's not just a rah-rah session, session, session. Excuse me. It's not just a positive uh, thinking session. This will help you to see how you can work with other people better, uh, how you can uh, develop new ideas better, how you can think differently, how you can um, plan your time better, set your set priorities better. Um, a lot of things that that will are pivotal in your success. This book talks about and supplemented by the videos that we will watch. Um, anyway, that's that's one of the covers. They have a new cover now, but that's the older cover. What is success? What do you think? What is success? To you, what is success? What's success? You have some idea. Any idea? Any idea? Achieving what you want? Success? Do you have some success? Can I tell you what success is? No. I can't tell you what success is. Not for you. Because success for you is going to be totally different than what success for me is. Um, some people's success is totally centered around their career. I already mentioned I'm a workaholic. So obviously my career has a lot to do with my sense of success. Um, but at the same time, you recognize that that's not the only element of success. So it's, uh, I mean, happiness, just happiness. Uh, that's the same question. Is happiness equal success? Is it the same thing? Are they equal? Are they incompatible? Is happiness incompatible, not compatible, with success? If you have success, will you be happy? One of the other uh, uh, authors that I'm going to introduce you to uh, is the current genius. Um, Covey was the previous genius uh, that everybody was listening to. He uh, passed away a few years ago. Uh, but the new genius is named Clayton Christensen. Uh, every year, the uh, universities in 
in uh, uh, the UK, not every year, excuse me, every two years, they have kind of a, an, awards, uh, an awards ceremony uh, for the top thinkers in business. Uh, and so out of all the top thinkers in business, Clayton Christensen was chosen not just once, but twice, twice in a row. That made some people mad. <laughs> you know, they thought they should distribute the award more to more people. Clayton Christensen is a genius, absolutely. Uh, and he's turning the world of business upside down. A lot of his thinking is, um, is about business. Um, how basically universities, even like Harvard, are teaching what they're teaching is destroying big businesses. Uh, for example, uh, one of the first things people are taught is how, how many are majoring in business at some level? Okay. Okay, don't listen to your professors. Uh, I'm teasing. Uh, but hopefully your professors know who Clayton Christensen is. Because Clayton Christensen is warning the, the universities that they're teaching students the wrong thing in some cases. For example, one of the things they teach students um, let me see what time it is. I'm getting a feeling like maybe we're going over. I'll get my mobile out here. Anyway, one of the one of the things that he teaches is that when they say your customer's always right, they're absolutely dead wrong. Your customer is not always right. In fact, if you believe that your customer's always right, your business is likely to be destroyed. In this day and age. Uh, why do you think that would be? Why do you think your customer's going to destroy your business if you listen to them too carefully? Any ideas? Well, he did some research. His, like his PhD business, he was already successful in business. He had already become a multimillionaire in business himself before he went back to get his doctorate. He got a doctorate from Harvard and did some uh, additional post doctoral work at uh, Oxford. And uh, he, uh, uh, his dissertation was about why it is that little companies, startup companies, can't overcome big monopoly companies. So how, how is that possible? The monopoly companies have all the advantages. And yet time after time after time, you've seen little companies overcome big companies. And so that was his, his area of interest that he's been studying all of his all of his career uh, since uh, you know, starting his doctoral work. Um, and just one example uh, was he studied computers, uh, the computer industry, when I was young. Uh, at the start of the PC era, the hard drives were like that big in a computer, quite large. Uh, a few years later, I don't remember exactly how long, but uh, maybe eight years later or so, they decided they could put them that large and still put just as much memory, maybe more memory, at that size. And then they went that small, and now in some cases they don't have any, any disk at all. Um, there were 51 companies that knew how to make, who were making this size of hard drive. When they went to this small, all of them knew how to do it. All 51 companies, how to do this? How to do, how to do the, the smaller ones? What was their mistake? They asked the customer. They asked the customer, do you want us to go to the smaller hard drive? And the customer said, why do you want that? We're happy with what, what we have right now. Because what they didn't ask and what the consumers could not answer in this day and age, what would you want? They couldn't have, couldn't quite imagine why there was a benefit to having a smaller hard drive. And so they, you know, when they were asked, do you want a smaller hard drive? Why? Yeah, I see, we see no benefits in this. And they said, no, we don't want a smaller hard drive. And so the 51 companies didn't make smaller hard drives. Other companies, startup companies, came into the into the uh, compete with them, and they made the hard, they specialized in the smaller hard drive. And because they specialized in the smaller hard drive, they did it better than the bigger companies. So when the big companies realized, oop, our customers were wrong, it was too late for many of them. And so after these three steps, these three generations of people making the same mistake over and over again, and asking their customers, only three of the 51 companies that were were dominating. With the big hard drive, so this, the rest are all out of business. 
because they listen to their, their customers. Uh, there's a number of other things I won't go into right now. We'll talk about uh, Christensen later. But one reason why I brought him up is that he also wrote a book on how to be happy. How do you measure your life? I think it's something like that. Um, how you measure your life, I think is the title, something like that. Anyway, what he realized was over the years, he, uh, he had his friends that he had worked with at Harvard and Oxford, they graduated with them. Very brilliant people, smartest people in the world, uh, graduated with him at Harvard and, and worked with him at, at Oxford. All these people had gone through divorce, their families had been destroyed, um, and so his book is about not letting that happen and why it happens, why it happens, and how to prevent it from happening. Uh, and I'm not going to go into the details of his book, but that's one of his most popular books now is not about business, but how not to let your career destroy your life, basically. Um, and so, success and happiness are sometimes, are diametrically opposed if you allow them to be. Um, because those people obviously did not set out to have their families destroyed uh, when they started. And they certainly didn't look back and say, gee, I sure destroyed my family well. Uh, that was not one of their highlights of their lives. And so they can be diametrically opposed to one another uh, if you can't balance, find balance in it somehow. So um, what is success? What is success will differ for each one of us. Um, there's even uh, a, another uh, video I might show it to you right now today. Maybe I'll wait with that. But there's a video uh, that that basically says people who are trying to achieve success are almost universally unhappy. Not universally, but at least a large portion of those who, because they don't know what success is. They haven't figured out what success is. And to them, success was the career in most cases. They, they put these high goals that they want to achieve in their careers and they screwed up their lives in the process of doing it. Uh, or they actually achieve it, and they once they achieve it, they realize, is this all there is to it? I worked all my life to achieve success. Here I am. Is this all there is? You know some of the, the highest suicide rates are in Hollywood, and including by people who are st stars. I mean, you, you can probably think of some. Um, when I was uh, uh, in the 1980s, there was uh, one name. Uh, see his brother was Jim Belushi. His name is I forget his Belushi. Anyway, he was a comedian. I forget his first name now, right off the top of my head. But his brother continued as an actor, or was a popular actor. But uh, anyway, the this Belushi, I forget his first name, uh, was the bigger star. He was super famous, super popular, a uh, great comedian. And uh, in his case, you know, he overdosed in, on drugs. But before he did that, he, I, we had a mutual friend, a journalist uh, for uh, the village, or not for the, for the, been away from America too long. Uh, for, I forget the magazine. Anyway, a magazine uh, editor, writer, uh, had spent some time with him, and Belushi told him, despite all of his success, all of his wealth, all of his popularity, uh, he said, my, I'm miserable. I am totally miserable. I don't have a life of my own. And it was very shortly after that that he died from a drug overdose. So some of us, uh, in fact, a survey of millennials suggests that millennials think success is fame and fortune, that that's success. And yet, many of those who achieve fame and fortune are downright suicidal. They hate it. They hate it. They got there and they say, is this all there is to life? Uh, so, 
trying to figure out what success, success is is really important. And it's one of the things we'll, we'll, I'll give you a chance to think about in this class. I want you to think about it. Um, and I'm not necessarily the best example of it. I'm just saying it's something we all need to ponder. Um, as a workaholic, I need to maybe tone my work down a little bit personally. Um, what is our success? What's our success look like? Think about it. I do, I think I will go ahead and show this video. Um, let me uh, find that real quick. It's very short. Uh, I think it's like, I think less than 10 minutes. Uh, here, there's more to life than being happy. Now, what she's, this is what I was saying, is to her, being happy is kind of, uh, well, when you ask people what it will make you happy, it's this, it's, uh, you know, fame and fortune is the response. I'm going to turn that on. And I see I need to... I used to think the whole purpose of life was pursuing happiness. Oh. Everyone said the path to happiness was success. So I searched for that ideal job, that perfect boyfriend, that beautiful apartment. But instead of ever feeling fulfilled, I felt anxious and adrift. And I wasn't alone. My friends, they struggled with this too. Eventually, I decided to go to graduate school for positive psychology to learn what truly makes people happy. But what I discovered there changed my life. The data shows that chasing happiness can make people unhappy. And what really struck me was this. The suicide rate has been rising around the world, and it recently reached a 30-year high in America. Even though life is getting objectively better by nearly every conceivable standard, more people feel hopeless, depressed, and alone. There's an emptiness gnawing away at people, and you don't have to be clinically depressed to feel it. Sooner or later, I think we all wonder, is this all there is? And according to the research, what predicts this despair is not a lack of happiness. It's a lack of something else, a lack of having meaning in life. But that raised some questions for me. Is there more to life than being happy? And what's the difference between being happy and having meaning in life? Many psychologists define happiness as a state of comfort and ease, feeling good in the moment. Meaning, though, is deeper. The renowned psychologist Martin Seligman says meaning comes from belonging to and serving something beyond yourself, and from developing the best within you. Our culture is obsessed with happiness, but I came to see that seeking meaning is the more fulfilling path. And the studies show that people who have meaning in life, they're more resilient, they do better in school and at work, and they even live longer. So this all made me wonder, how can we each live more meaningfully? To find out, I spent five years interviewing hundreds of people and reading through thousands of pages of psychology, neuroscience, and philosophy. Bringing it all together, I found that there are what I call four pillars of a meaningful life. And we can each create lives of meaning by building some or all of these pillars in our lives. The first pillar is belonging. Belonging comes from being in relationships where you're valued for who you are intrinsically and where you value others as well. But some groups and relationships deliver a cheap form of belonging. You're valued for what you believe, for who you hate, not for who you are. True belonging springs from love. It lives in moments among individuals, and it's a choice you choose to cultivate belonging with others. Here's an example. Each morning, my friend Jonathan buys a newspaper from the same street vendor in New York. They don't just conduct a transaction, though. They take a moment to slow down, talk, 
and treat each other like humans. But one time, Jonathan didn't have the right change. And the vendor said, don't worry about it. But Jonathan insisted on paying. So he went to the store and bought something he didn't need to make change. But when he gave the money to the vendor, the vendor drew back. He was hurt. He was trying to do something kind, but Jonathan had rejected him. I think we all reject people in small ways like this without realizing it. I do. I'll walk by someone I know and barely acknowledge them. I'll check my phone when someone's talking to me. These acts devalue others. They make them feel invisible and unworthy. But when you lead with love, you create a bond that lifts each of you up. For many people, belonging is the most essential source of meaning, those bonds to family and friends. For others, the key to meaning is the second pillar, purpose. Now, finding your purpose is not the same thing as finding that job that makes you happy. Purpose is less about what you want than about what you give. A hospital custodian told me her purpose is healing sick people. Many parents tell me, my purpose is raising my children. The key to purpose is using your strengths to serve others. Of course, for many of us, that happens through work. That's how we contribute and feel needed. But that also means that issues like disengagement at work, unemployment, low labor force participation, these aren't just economic problems, they're existential ones too. Without something worthwhile to do, people flounder.